If you want to trace the broad strokes of history in the world of Narnia to understand its development, its theme, and its overarching narrative, one of the best places to start is by tracing the path of the creator of Narnia himself, Aslan the Lion. And today, we're going to do just that, mapping out the complete travels of Aslan, noting the location and the circumstance of every appearance he makes in the entire Narnian timeline. Now, as an important note, we'll be focusing only on the actual physical appearances of Aslan and not on dreams or visions or any other type of psychic communication. Now, before we go any farther, I want to take a minute and talk to you about something that's really important to me. And you don't want to skip ahead because in just a few minutes, I'll be telling you how you can get some free Into the Wardrobe swag. You know, one of the reasons that C.S. Lewis wrote the Narnian books was to prepare young people to boldly face the world that awaited them, equipped to stand strong with the truth, virtue, and faith. In this uncertain world that we live in today, young people need preparation more than ever. That's why I am so excited to announce that Into the Wardrobe is partnering with Boyce College, a college that I've loved and believed in for many, many years. Boyce College in Louisville, Kentucky prepares graduates for the what and the who they will be after college. One way Boyce College accomplishes this is by emphasizing faith first, a biblically faithful understanding of the Bible and a life-centering relationship with Jesus Christ are foundational to everything Boyce College does and all that they teach. Now, you and your student can experience faith first firsthand during Boyce College's preview days. Register at boycecollege.com slash Narnia and use the promo code Narnia to waive the $25 student registration fee. Now, not only that, but if you attend this experience, I'll send you a free Into the Wardrobe mug with original Into the Wardrobe artwork. And if you're coming, please let me know. I'd love to meet you personally and tell you why I think Boyce College is in an absolutely amazing place to prepare for the world ahead. And finally, a shout out to all the supporters at Patreon. We've had some really amazing discussions about this week's video, and I'm so thankful for the supporters of the entire wardrobe community. If you'd like to join this community and help the work of this channel continue to reach new audiences, then check us out at patreon.com slash wardrobe. Well, there's an entire world history to cover today, so let's get started. It's time to leave the Shadowlands behind and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. Aslan the Lion, also known as the son of the great emperor across the sea, among other names, first appeared in Narnia, well, at its very beginning, the dawn of time when the deep magic was written. Well, technically, he was present when the deeper magic was written, even before the dawn of time, and it was Aslan himself that sang the world of Narnia into existence. Now, this amazing event was witnessed through the accidental arrival of Diggory Kirk and his uncle, Andrew Ketterling, Polly Plummer, Jadis, the last Empress of Charn, and an English cabbie named Frank and his horse, Strawberry. Now, this took place on the western edge of Narnia in a region that would later become known as Lantern Waste, the site where Jadis struck Aslan with a broken lamppost, which would become the famous landmark of the first meeting between Lucy Pevensey and Tumnus the Fawn. Aslan remained in this area for the first few days of the newborn world and then traveled a short distance to the next location, the site of the Tree of Protection. It was here that he commanded Diggory to plant a silver apple from his garden, which would grow into the namesake tree that guarded Narnia from tyranny for nearly a millennia. After his time marking the beginning of Narnia, Aslan left his newly created world, taking along Diggory Kirk and Polly Plummer into the interdimensional hub known as the Wood Between the Worlds. He sent the pair back to their home world of England in the year 1900 AD. Now, Narnian history records Aslan's next appearance 1,000 years later in the Narnian year 1000 NT, when he returned to Narnia after being gone for quite some time, at least 100 years if not longer. It was at a military encampment on the ancient hill of the Stone Table that Aslan met Susan, Lucy, and Peter Pevensey for the first time. Aslan then traveled with his army down the hill to the nearby Fords of Baruna, indicating that the hill would soon need to be used for other purposes. Now, while the army remained at the Fords of Baruna, Aslan traveled back up the hill to the Stone Table itself, which would be the site of his execution at the hands of Jadis. However, the next day, it would also be the site of his resurrection, which was witnessed by Susan and Lucy Pevensey and a company of field mice. 
Soon after, Aslan swiftly carried Lucy and Susan on his back to the next location, the castle of Jadis, to her courtyard to be exact. Here, Aslan breathed on the victims of Jadis who had been turned to stone, restoring them and rallying them to the next waypoint, the battlefield at Baruna. Here the Narnian army defeated the army of the White Witch and Aslan brought true justice to Narnia by killing Jadis herself. The next day, Aslan and the army along with the Pevensey siblings set out eastward along the Great River. And the following day, the company reached the mouth of the river on the Great Eastern Ocean. They had arrived at the legendary castle Caer Paravel, where the next day Aslan would crown the siblings kings and queens of Narnia. Now, in the midst of the celebration, Aslan slipped away quietly. But Mr. Beaver assured the Pevensies that Aslan would be coming and going, but they would see him again soon. Now, not long after that evening, Aslan traveled to the far southern reaches of the world in the land of Kalorman, where he swam in the southern sea to a small rowboat that was set adrift and contained a baby boy and a dead knight. He pushed the child to safety setting the boat ashore near the cottage of a Kalorman fisherman named Arshish. Now that boy would become known as Shasta, and 14 years later, in 1014 NT, he found himself riding along the southeastern coast of Kalorman, not only fleeing Arshish, but now fleeing a lion. Now Aslan eventually abandoned this chase, and Shasta joined with another runaway known as Erevis. A few nights later, Aslan next appeared in the tombs north of Tashban, where he stealthily protected Shasta from nearby jackals and even appeared to him in the form of a small cat to bring him comfort. Aslan next traveled to the southern march between the border of Arkenland and Kalorman, where he chased the riders and their steeds for a mile all the way to the hermitage at the southern march, where once again he promptly disappeared. While Erevis stayed with the horses at the hermitage, Shasta continued northward, where in the cold blackness of night, Shasta met Aslan at a location known as Stormness Pass. Aslan once again stealthily escorted Shasta, ensuring the boy's safety as he traversed the dangerously rugged terrain. Aslan then returned southward once again to the hermitage, where he offered a brief word of encouragement to Erevis, Bree, and Hwen and then, in one bound, reached the top of the hermitage wall and vanished from their sight. From there, Aslan traveled northward again to the castle Anvard in the mountains of Arkenland. When he arrived, he met a tribunal, which had gathered to offer terms to the captured leader of the failed Kalorman invasion known as Prince Rabidash. After Rabidash refused the terms of his release, Aslan turned him into a donkey, temporarily, of course. After this campaign, History does not record another appearance of Aslan for another 1300 years, until the year 2303. During this time, the Pevensey siblings had returned to Narnia and set out on a journey to Aslan's Howe. When they reached the gorge at the River Rush and became uncertain about which way to travel, Aslan appeared to Lucy and only Lucy. However, against Lucy's pleas, the group made a winding and ultimately fruitless journey away from Aslan and towards Baruna before backtracking almost the entire way. Aslan then appeared once again to Lucy and now the others as well in a clearing a little more to the east and just next to a grove of fir trees. He led the party at first away from the Howe westward and then showing them an opening in the gorge back up to the other side of the gorge, now nearer to their destination. While Peter and Edmund continued on northward to Aslan's Howe, Lucy and Susan stayed behind with Aslan to feast with some very strange Narnian visitors. The party then traveled along the River Rush to the city of Baruna, where they gathered more and more members of their parade as they marched northward through the town. And they continued northward following the great river through farms and villages all the way to Beaver's Dam. And there, they promptly crossed the river and came south again, all the way to the battlefield by the bridge of Baruna. When they arrived, Aslan loosened the chains of the great river god, who destroyed the bridge and cut off the escape route of the retreating Telmarine army. Now, five days later, the Pevensies returned to their home in our world. Now, several recorded appearances of Aslan take place three years later in the Narnian year 2306 during the famous voyage of the legendary ship Dontreader. 
During this journey, Aslan didn't travel with the crew, but he did seem to follow them along on their journey, by his own mysterious means, presumably through teleportation. Now, Aslan was first spotted in the remote and uncharted reaches of the far eastern ocean on an island known as Dragon Island. It was on Dragon Island that Aslan came to the aid of Eustace Scrub, who had been pitifully cursed and turned into a dragon. Aslan restored Eustace and wasn't seen in that place again. Aslan was next spotted on the notorious Deathwater Island, a place with a tempting but deadly magical pool that turned anything and everyone who fell into it into gold. Now here, he was only spotted for a very brief moment by the landing party, but it was enough to help them come to their senses and escape the island. As the voyagers continued, Aslan next made an appearance, quite literally, on the island of the monopods, where he was made visible by Lucy's visibility spell. That very same day, before the sun set, Aslan traveled all the way back to Narnia to Ker Paravel, where he provided an update of the voyage to the Lord Regent Trumpkin the Dwarf. And many, many weeks later, Lucy, Edmund, and Eustace reached the end of the Silver Sea and the edge of the world. And there, Aslan was waiting for them, first in the form of a lamb, and then, once again, as the great noble lion. This would be the last time Lucy and Edmund would encounter Aslan in the world of Narnia. Five decades later, in the Narnian year 2356, Aslan stood at the great mountain's edge in Aslan's country, overlooking Narnia. With a powerful blow from his mighty breath, he safely carried Eustace Scrug across the Eastern Ocean into Ker Paravel, and similarly, he sent Jill Pole to Narnia with a crucial message. Now, remarkably, Aslan wasn't seen again until Jill, Eustace, and their companion Puddleglum returned from their long journey across the northern lands and the Earth's deepest depths to rescue Prince Rillian, Caspian's son. During their quest, they relied only on Aslan's words to Jill for guidance and encouragement. And after the group broke the enchantment of the Green Witch and Rillian defeated her for good, the party returned to Ker Paravel just in time for Rillian to embrace his dying father one last time. Moments later, Aslan returned to Ker Paravel to take Eustace and Jill back to Aslan's mountain. In an instant, the three were back on the mountain where, with a mighty roar, Aslan created a portal that stretched across the multiverse and back to our world. To everyone's surprise, Aslan actually traveled with Jill, Eustace, and the resurrected Caspian back to Experiment House in England. However, Aslan only traveled as far as the gap in the wall that bridged the gateway from Aslan's country to our world. The final time Aslan's presence is recorded in Narnian history is actually at the end of Narnian history, at the site of the world's final battle known as Stable Hill. Now, after this battle had taken place and the last king of Narnia met the seven friends of Narnia behind the stable door, Aslan came to greet them and began the work of bringing an end to Narnia. He woke Father Time and called home the stars and welcomed all friends of Narnia into the stable doors. And when the world had turned black and icy, he commanded Peter to shut the door. But that is not the end of the travels of Aslan, because there, on the other side of that door, was Aslan's country. And though he now no longer looked like a lion, there was Aslan. Though the stories of Narnia had come to an end, it was only the beginning of the great story that goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Do you know the three most asked questions from parents who are searching for the right fit college for their student? Find the questions and the answers at boyscollege.com faith.